out of the box with Rosie Tran. I'm here with documentary filmmaker Brady Hollengren. Brady, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to talk about your film today, The Long Green Line, and also um, you were a producer on Missing and Presumed Dead? Yes. Yes, yeah. I was a co-producer on that. Is, yes. How did you get involved with a production like that? I mean, that... Um, is such an interesting documentary. Sure. Uh, so tell well, us a little bit about the documentary so people... Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, well, the, uh, my good friend, Bill Dumas, uh, he's the director and the producer of, you know, the film. And he had been working on it for many years. It's about his, you know, uncle and uh, his lost uncle that was left over in uh, Vietnam, uh, over in uh, Korea. And I... Moved to L.A. from Chicago, uh, knew no one, uh, ran into Bill on a job, and So what is talking. the film about? It is a, it's about POWs, right? Yes, it is about POWs. It's about uh, a story that um, is really untold about the 8,000 uh, U.N. soldiers, primarily U.S. soldiers, that were left over in Korea after the war. And they were that's not a lot ex- of soldiers. Yes, that's, there were. And they were not exchanged. That is a huge number of soldiers. Yes. And many of them um, were in line to be repatriated. And the uh, Korean, the North Koreans and the Chinese did take them out of lines and put them back into camps and ship them off to China and uh, Russia. Wow. So these are U.S. soldiers that are were presumably turned into like almost slaves. Basically, yes. Yes. Slave labor. Um, most of them that were, are uh, sort of accounted for um, had a lot of specialty training, uh, a lot of engineers, uh, things like that, that uh, the Chinese and North Koreans uh, decided to uh, keep imprisoned as POWs. And you, you, did you get to interview and be in direct contact with some of these people? Um, no, I mean, we did uh, interview several, uh, you know, POWs that were in the camps, camps that, that were in, uh, were with Roger in the POW camps. Uh, the government mostly denied that he was really even a POW and made him more of missing in action. And then um, in 1954, <laughs> um, you know, they basically made everyone, um, you know, uh, they presumed him dead even without any evidence. So have any of these POWs now been able to contact family from back home? Or are they, I mean, do, do, what, what is the documentary showing about them? Is, is anyone still uh, alive? Or do you well, think that's basically are- the biggest story is like, are, are they still alive? Um, even in the early 2000s, there have been South Korean POWs that have escaped North Korea that were in prison since 1950. Wow, that's a culture shock to yes. be escape from that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Can you imagine being in like a 1950s North Korean prison camp and then waking yeah. up to society now? L- yeah, literally. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, years later, you finally escape out of the, you know, the hermit kingdom that is there. And nobody knew you even existed. I, I think that there was people probably that known, but it's sad that the U.S. government would deny that. Yes, yes. They, they don't want to um, have to rewrite history. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of that, actually. When I was overseas um, in Iraq, it was crazy because, you know, a lot of people in mainstream America consider some of this type of conspiracy theory talk. Yes. (laughs) Yes, but it's not. It's not. I have read I have read plenty of documents that were, you know, got out of the Pentagon and a lot of different papers that are quite scary. Were you scared working on this production just as a producer? I mean, obviously you're in Hollywood, that's a little bit different, but documentary filmmaking, I think, is a lot different than mainstream corporate, you know, um, studio films, obviously. Yes, it is. It's, yes. And I work on those as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should bleep out your last name in case. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> it's all right. I'm on a lot of lists anyway, so. <laughs> but I mean... um, just working on productions like this, were you ever scared for your life? Were you scared that, hey, maybe I'm going to be added to a list? I actually have several friends that are on the Homeland Security list. Uh, Probably wrongfully. Uh, actually, Or yes. maybe, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> no, actually wrongfully. Um, yes, I've met many people that they're like, I, why am I on the list? Yeah. So, so were you ever scared for your life or have you been scared for your life to do research on this type of information? Um, yes, that, that film did... Um, kind of scare you a little <laughs> disturbed me and scared me uh, you know and stories that were told to me uh, you know about government officials and so what do you think about people, all this NSA people dis- stuff? people disappearing like what you do you th- what do you think about all this NSA stuff about the government trying to censor people and get information and all these you know with SOPA and the internet um, kind of 
they're trying to pass these yeah, laws. Yeah, but the, stuff. this, do you, this do you has think... been going on forever. But, so this is not big news to me. <laughs> no, I, but what is so? What is your opinion of all that? Do you think it's just getting worse, or like what is your? I think doing it's all it, this research. About I think it? it's increased, increasingly got worse for mm-hmm. sure. the The amount of data that they are tracking and cataloging and making reports. Um, I think it's gotten worse. And, you know, one thing is, of course, the digital age has increased that amount of information. Um, you know, before the Internet, um, there wasn't as much free information floating around and there wasn't as much talking amongst different groups of people. So most of the information that was gathered by the government was, you know, on the ground investigations. Now, you know, now they're just roping out all of this. You can put a social general, security number and get whatever general information. They grab all these things and things that you may not even be attached to, and you know, whatever your IP address went wrong spot, or somebody used your IP address, that doesn't mean it was you. Mm-hmm. And they can snag the wrong people, and they've been doing it a lot. And there are a lot of people that they're we don't know where they are. So, were you able to? Um the, so these nor- these U.S. soldiers that escaped North Korea are they part of the documentary or were they people? Well, no, were- no, we don't have any U.S. soldiers that have been that have escaped. Okay, so who? South so Korea. There were a South Korean. There were South soldiers. Korean soldiers. Yes. Excuse yes. me. Sorry about that. Yes, yes. There were. Um, we didn't get to talk to them, um, but um, the most recent one that did escape was in 2003, mm-hmm. and he had been in there since the Korean War. Oh wow. Um, we did talk to a lot of other POWs that were uh, U.S. POWs that were in the camps, um, and the and whole. Were they saying that there's still people there? Oh, yes. Many of them were like, yes, they're there. Uh, Many of them witnessed while they were being repatriated over um, the DMZ that, you know, they saw soldiers, you know, uh, taken out of line. You know, U.S. soldiers taken out of line, put back on trucks and shipped back into North Korea. So we do have eyewitnesses and we have eyewitnesses, um, you know, uh, Bill Dumas, the director, his uncle, um, has been tracking, you know, his his brother Roger. Um, he enlisted in, um, you know, to go to war. Uh, well, not considered a war, but um, into Korea to find his brother. So his brother disappeared in 1950, and his brother enlisted to go find him. They had five brothers that fought over there and everything like that. Um, and there, we do have witnesses that were in the POW camps with Roger. Um, they didn't, uh, you know, acknowledge that. You know, he even was, in, you know, the government doesn't say he was in the camps or anything, but we have guys that said he was there um, and he never came back and he was known to be alive at the end of the war. Wow. You know, so all of these soldiers are just being said missing. We don't know. Yeah. They, and, missing the, in combat, and, whatever. and we have witnesses that the president said, no, leave them there. We don't want to start another war. So you ha- you guys have found actual physical proof. Yes. There are people that have testified to that. Wow. <laughs> but those meetings... Um, Intense stuff. Many, many politicians don't want to be, you know, they don't want to hear that. So a lot of them... They don't want to get their hands dirty. Yeah. And a lot of them that were on committees and things walked out. They left those committees and never even heard eyewitness testimony. Um, you know, and there were a few, you know, people that were supposed to testify that had heart, uh, you know, had heart attacks before they were supposed to testify or were like something happened quote unquote to them yeah i mean there, suspicious, were, there were extremely suspicious i mean there were there were two <laughs> two that had heart attacks and they were supposed to testify do you think that maybe something happens to them or do you think the stress of being part of something like that brought upon the heart attack or both no i think i i don't know I'm not quite sure. On that one. <laughs> You're like, I'm not going on the record to say yeah, anything. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that I mean, that film really kind of got me rolling into doing more documentaries and things like that. Um, you know, I did documentary uh, work when I was uh, in my undergrad as well. So you know, when I came out, you know, meeting Bill, we hit it off, and you know, I became co-producer on the film. Did a lot of research. Um, did you know production with them, and and did a lot of work with them on it. So what is the scariest yeah. thing that you found? Like when you were doing research for this film or interviewing people or getting documents or data, what was the scariest thing that you were like, oh, crap, <laughs> this is really freaking me out about the U.S. government? Other uh, things I just w- You're re- not allowed to I say. Would, well, I'm allowed to say, but I would prefer <laughs> not to talk about it because there were things that, uh, yeah, were frightening. Okay. If you, if you don't prefer to talk about what... 
okay how can i word this um is it just really dark stuff or is it just you don't you don't want to lose your faith in the u.s government and humanity in general no it's very dark (laughs) it's pretty pretty dark oh yeah yeah i mean there are people that kill people that's what they do okay got it (laughs) you know and there are agents of our government you know that take care of things so it's not just like a hollywood movie thing when you see those no it is not agent things no okay no it is not (laughs) Um, although movies you know a lot of smoke and mirrors too okay (laughs) um no it is movie magic and that's what i do i know when i I, when i went to iraq i met a lot of soldiers who had a lot of conspiracy theories against the u.s government and you think now these guys are guys that are being paid to risk their life for the U.S. government. You know, we don't have any sort of mandatory military or draft. So these are guys who are volunteering. Yes. Right. We have a volunteer military. And yet they had the most conspiracy (laughs) theories out of anyone I've ever met. And so I think when people in the mainstream are like, oh, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. These are guys who are on the front lines. Yes. And they're like, something suspicious is going on. Well, yes. And (laughs) they all talk. And they're a lot of information. I, I had know. guys that said, you know, Rosie, I'm not trying to like impress you or be like a badass. I can say for a fact that I've been told to kill people that I know should not have been killed. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've talked to many guys that no, they they shouldn't have done that. But I, they, I've been told they to, take the order. Yeah. I've been told you don't question that to take orders. I've been told to kill certain people. I've been told to rummage through certain homes. And a lot of these guys um, had, you know, PTSD. Yes. Oh, yeah. And knew that they had PTSD from being forced to do things that they felt were immoral. For sure. Or, um, you know, just not not. You're not supposed to question orders, and you're and you're supposed to be a soldier, and you're supposed to be you know a robot, but you're human. Yes. And in the back of your mind, you have emotions. And you, you have emotions. You can't. You can't hold those. You know, you can only hold those back for so long. Like a lot of like a lot of guys are like, oh well, I'm tough, or I you know I can handle it, and I don't think that. Anyone, especially a lot of these guys are 18, 19, 20 years old. Yes. And that is a very emotionally immature age. Yes. And you're developing as it is right there. As a person. Yeah. Yes. So and when, you're developing everything that you know about yourself and what exists out there. And what and what life is and what society is. And it's a lot of our military, you know, men and women come from smaller towns or places yes. where they haven't been exposed to this. And then they're being shipped halfway around the world and saying, kill this person or do this and do that. And regardless of what life experience you have i think a part of you is like um i'm not so sure about this well yes 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 <laughs> and regardless of you know how educated you've been about certain issues um you can't hold back certain things that you feel and i think and that you have to have a certain mental makeup to be able to do some of those jobs you and do and i think a lot of people don't have the mental makeup they, which they don't explains the there's, PTSD. Very, there's a small amount that are able to do that you yes. know and they sadly are very good at that <laughs> you know <laughs> and i've talked to some of them and it's like whoa wow you've done those things yeah so and I, you I don't just, think about it much well i think that they're able to compartmentalize it but i do still think that there's a part of them that's like wait a minute but um definitely a lot of soldiers that i met had ptsd and knew that they had ptsd and could exactly pinpoint kind of what it was from yes and i also had a lot of um soldiers that i met that had crazy conspiracy theories and were kind of afraid to tell me because everything's monitored when you go over there when i went oh, over for there for sure for sure i couldn't even send an email without this you know it was on a monitored computer and um when i made phone calls it had to be from a base phone and mm-hmm. you know certain things that you say are kind of um no you're watched 24 7 yeah and i'm just a comedian like yeah. i wasn't even yeah. doing anything <laughs> well hey uh but uh, the words can be very powerful as well so um and, I mean, I'll, I'll always go back beca- and I'll always go back regardless because I love supporting the troops. And I don't think that these individual people should be held responsible for the negative actions of the U.S. military. For sure. The, for sure. He, basically, a lot. Of, I think a lot of people join because, you know, they want to serve their country. They have a genuine yes. desire to serve their country and they don't know for, about for all the, the right, corruption. For, for the, the right, right reasons. reasons. And they don't realize yeah. all the corruption. And another reason is a lot of people, you know, it's like a lot of these kids just want college money. Well, they're just trying to survive. They're just trying to survive. And, they're and, you, not, and there's not always a lot of options at, at, in certain areas of this country, especially, you know, in the last five, six, seven years as the economy has collapsed and we're still trying to recover. You don't have anything. 
you got to survive. I I will yeah, and always. That's, that's one option is the military. It'll exactly. take. It'll ta- they'll take care of you. They'll take anyone. Yeah, <laughs> they're ready. Yeah, <laughs> to a point. To a point. To a point. To a point. Are you a serial killer? No, you cannot join. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you will become one. No. Um. So I I'll always support the troops no matter what. Oh, I will too. I will but too. I mean, they're... I don't think it's fair for the U.S. government to use our men and women to um complete corrupt initiatives and yeah i agree i agree and go go into unjust situations with uh false information you know and the false information that has been thrown around forever now is gotten out of hand and that's gotten us into multiple wars i agree with that and i absolutely do not think that these soldiers who are willing to risk their lives and their families you know future should be left overseas in that type of situation and i'm sure that the korean conflict was not the first or the last no 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 i mean the you know especially the the pow issue has been going on for every war i mean we we left soldiers behind in world war ii we left soldiers behind in korea we left soldiers back in vietnam um and for many 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 years we don't know how long those guys and some of them could still be alive now, I don't have an issue. I have issues with people being left behind. I don't have an issue with people left behind that aren't known to be there. But you're saying the government knew about oh, they these knew. people. Oh, they knew. They're like, screw them. We don't care. Yeah, they didn't. Let's move they on. didn't want to start another war. The war ended. They didn't want to start another problem. They felt like, well, what's what's a few people? Nobody will know. And nobody really has. Well, 8,000 people is a lot of people. (laughs) But, uh, yes, but the general public doesn't have any understanding of that. And, you know, this this has been being fought since the 50s about revealing this information. And I'm even sure there's, there's been a some, lot of information that yeah. needs to be revealed. There's a lot, yes, yes. And even after you have multiple subcommittees on the Hill, still nothing happens. But nobody wants to hear about it. So, you know, a lot of those politicians, they... They don't want to get involved. Um, there are particular... They're like, I'm trying to get some lobby money. Yes, yes. Can you please stop talking about this? Special <laughs> special interests, you know. Well, and, and several of them, I won't say by name, um, you know, we're in Vietnam and they they have they have certain records they do not want revealed. Mm-hmm. Um, s- recently, some of those have been sealed for life. So we can't find out what they those particular politicians were doing when they were in Vietnam and what happened to them. Well, the thing that really bothers me is that not that the information is being held, but the misinformation in general and the brainwashing of the mainstream media. I mean, I agree. If you go to the average person just in the middle of America and start telling them about some of these things that go on, they think you're a Looney Tune. Oh, no. They think you're conspiracy theorists. They think you're crazy. You're just you're again, and then and then it goes into you're you're unpatriotic and all of these things. Well, I know. think patriotism is actually used to brainwash a lot of middle America a into lot. not questioning. And yes. I would say, as a very very proud American, that part of being an American is questioning. Yes, I agree. I question everything because part of being an American is that freedom of speech and that freedom. Mm-hmm. If we truly represent freedom then we need to question everything because our founding fathers definitely were like, okay, they came to this country to establish it as a free country. And I think that America is based on a lot of very wonderful ideals and it's kind of strayed from those ideals. And I think whether you're on the right or the left, I think that every person can agree that, this country is kind of going to hell in a handbasket right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know people on both sides yes, um, of do, the political I spectrum. I, I do too, yes. Who are like, this country is going to hell in a freaking handbasket. It, it, it is, and to a point. To a point. And I just think that the thing that makes America wonderful is the people. Yes. And I think that we should never stop questioning because that no, no, is we how shouldn't. you know it turns into like Nazi Germany. Yes, v- very true. And the thing is, as we've seen as history goes, I mean... Things that were questioned but were not pushed, all of a sudden, 10, 20 years, 30 years later, we find out, oh, that was true. And we told... We that were, regularly happens, we were actually. Call it, we were calling all those people complete, you know, nutbags, and they're crazy because they said this is this or that, this. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's true. Yeah, I just don't like my personal civil liberties being taken away. Um, one, I agree. One of the things that bothers me the most, and this is so silly... Well, it's not silly to me, but it's so silly because it's kind of off topic, but it is on topic, is I think about a year ago, they started putting those naked scanners at LAX. Yes. And there was this huge, huge, huge uproar about it. 
and then nothing ever happened and now they're there permanently they're gonna oh, do I it know. as a sample and in, in i think terminal three they're just gonna yes. do it as a sample and now it's just there yes and so if you want to travel on a commercial airline you have to either be groped and yep. sexually molested by tsa yes or screened completely nude <laughs> yeah naked screener. yeah yeah oh i know and that and the, and once again you know the root of the problem is money it's all about the money yeah follow follow the trail so sadly that's why those are staying there because there's a lot of money involved to be made in the and a naked, lot the naked and a lot of contractors and a lot of kickbacks that go on well that was one of the things that i learned you know, overseas when i went from a lot of the iraqi lobbyists. soldiers well it was the the contractors the military contractors that are contracted it's ridiculous it's a lot of big business so it for those Huge. of you listening who don't understand it's all um, privatized there's <laughs> there's big business in war and uh, there is a lot of military contractors who do not work for the U.S. government. They are private contractors that are contracted. And how do you get those contracts is connections. Yes. And, there, um, and there's a lot of time there is a, there's no open bidding for some of those contracts. Well, I... Some of those some of those contracts go directly right to certain companies without even open bidding to over there other is companies. There is actually a lot of animosity because there are soldiers out there... There's billions there. of dollars being wasted. Well, there are soldiers out there who are on the front lines getting paid shit. Yeah. And risking their lives. And yep. then there's military contractors. I think Your contractors what, are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh, there was a secretary. You there know. was a secretary. And they're not even there all year. There was a secretary in Baghdad who was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Just a secretary. A secretary, yes. Just an administrative assistant doing yep. normal processing paperwork. And she was getting paid because the reason they use the contractors is because there's less red tape. Yes, there is. Yes. And less protocol, well, supposedly. Quote, quote unquote, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> so they're being hired and it's just, cr- I mean, there was a lot of animosity. The number one thing that I was told when I went over there was that I was there for the troops and the troops only not to, because a lot of the contractors would come and try to take pictures with me and do other things and they would take time away from the troops and the troops are risking their lives. Yeah, yes, yes. And getting paid yes. little to nothing while yes. these contractors they're, are making six they're, figures. They're volu- they volunteered to be there and to fight for their country. And you have guys that are, public, you know, contractors that are literally making a bajillion dollars compared to that guy that's being walked down that street every day that could get blown up you know and yes. you and they're you know and they're they're barely making any money they're barely making any money I mean, and, they, I, and some of them have a family well a lot of them have families you know, or a lot of and them e- and even career guys are still barely making what they should i mean you're putting your life on the line for god's sake the system is just completely crazy and it doesn't make any sense and i did not realize how bad it was till i went over there oh yeah it's and terrible i did not realize you know now i have tons of friends in the military and I know a little bit more about it, but it's just kind of a completely backward system. And probably um, our country would not be in the financial mess it was in. Yeah, it's I in agree. right now. Yep. If the whole military system with contractors was kind of like um, audited <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or yeah, something no, was oversight. done. I mean, the thing is, there's, there's just no oversight over things, what's going on. And things aren't transparent at all. It's I'm really scared to get assassinated by a military contractor now because. <laughs> well, yes, it's yes. <laughs> because I'm talking about it. Well, and you, with, you have to say, I'd say, don't worry about the, the contractors. It's the other guys that are that actually do really work for the government that you got to really watch out for. Well, there's a lot of censorship and scary stuff happening right now. Just in general, journalists are being shaken down by yes. that are exposing, you know, um, independent journalists are being shaken out that are exposing yes. things in the government. So there's a lot of like creepy, like Nazi Germany stuff going on right now that it's like people are scared to even have their freedom of speech in this country. In America. Oh, yes, I know. I know. And you have to be really careful about what you say, what you type and what you look for. So luckily, I'm just a comedian. So hopefully, no, exactly. one, no one is monitoring me. I'm just, I'm just a filmmaker and an editor here in Hollywood. So <laughs> I just, I just make movie magic. <laughs> so let's talk about. Um, we're getting really deep and dark, and you didn't yes, want to tell yes. me about all the creepy murders. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about your other film, The Long Green Line, which you also yes. produced. A very, so. a very big departure. Yep, I uh, produced, and I was the uh, the cinematographer as well. So tell me about the Long Green Line. Uh, the Long Green Line. Um, more of a, a passion project of mine. Um, you know, the film... It sounds is, like Missing Presumed Dead is a passion project. Well, yeah, I mean, that is too, but that... Another you know, passion. That's another passion, yes. <laughs> and that's through, you know, my good friend Bill. This, um, The Long Green Line, uh, my producing partner, uh, Matthew Arnold, and I, we helmed the film together. 
Um, I was the director of photography along with producing. And uh, So what is it about? And the film uh, follows uh, the most successful high school cross-country team in the the United States. Which you ran on. Which I ran on in high school, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're like, not to brag. Yes, I did. And, um, <laughs> you know, it follows uh, Mr. Newton, which is the, uh, he's the most successful high school coach in the history of uh, collegiate sports. Um, and I ran for Mr. Newton uh, back in the day. My brother ran for him, my father as well. Um, Your father? Um, my father, he had a, as a gym teacher, he did, he was, my father was a uh, football uh, player, but he did have Mr. Newton as okay, his gym like, teacher. Okay, so this is a lot of generations of politics. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Mr. Newton's been coaching at, uh, York high school for over 50 years now. Okay. Where is the school? Uh, it's outside of Chicago. It's okay. about, uh, 15 minutes, um, just west of the loop, the downtown. Your Chicago accent just came out really bad when you said uh-oh, Chicago. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> People say that. What, Chicago? What? (laughs) Well, you know, what can I say? You can take me out of there, but it's still there. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it follows the entire team. Uh, They're at the time when we shot it, they're going for their uh, 25th state title. Okay. uh, Which there is no other team that's done that. Um, And, you know, we researched the film for quite a while because it is a big story i mean there's uh you know multiple generations of runners just like myself you know my father had him as a gym teacher my brother ran for him i ran for him um you know he's very impacting on everybody's lives and there are there are a lot of a lot of runners that they literally when they have a family they move back to elmhurst so there's Just so their kids their kid can run there. for Mr. Newton. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. And so the thing I like about documentary filmmaking is it's really guerrilla filmmaking. You don't have this, you know, thirty five kajillion dollar budget. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. I don't no. Not like I have on some productions now. It's like, yay. <laughs> yay. No, money. this I'm alone sometimes <laughs> with a camera and running audio. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you guys raise the money for the film for those documentary um, filmmakers we, or filmmakers out there that are looking to create something on their own oh uh, we've self-financed the whole thing so um, does that mean credit card debt uh you know a little <laughs> bit and i mean we worked on, i mean we worked on the film for five years so it was you know of course we weren't working full time on it but we we're on you know on and off for that entire time um we did shoot the film in 05 um from July all the way till December. So I was shooting about six days a week, you know, for so that what, time. So what was the biggest challenge you had with, you know, you guys came up with this idea, you wanted to honor your former coach. Like, yeah, yeah, what, I mean, yeah. I mean, I... Did I mean, you guys I ha- have a storyline in mind or did you just, all right, we're just going to shoot? <laughs> well, I mean, that was the big thing is like, I mean, I had the story, I mean, I had his story in my head since I left high school. And when I left, I said, well, I will come back one day and make a film about him because he was extremely influential in my life and thousands of other guys. Cause also people have to realize that normal cross country teams, you maybe have about 30 guys on the team. The York team has usually 150 or more. And that's very unheard of in cross country. Usually mm-hmm. the entire team is only 30 guys. Um, but anyway, let me get back to where we were at. Um, raising money um, is extremely difficult. Um, and this is before we, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Oh yeah, and all yeah, that. none of that you, stuff. You guys existed. were you just like going door to door begging for money? <laughs> yeah, I mean, fa- family, friends, anything. I mean, all of my jobs that I worked, all of that money went right into the film. So basically, we we worked as much as we could to make as much money on other jobs to. To finance the, the film yeah. um we did at one point you know we had some big money maybe coming on board and that was going to happen and then you know i pack up my place and move to chicago and then the money falls through the floor so that's when all of a sudden it's like oh i'm here <laughs> so um okay so all everything's gonna come out of our pocket just like the last two years because we we researched the whole film for like two years we travel around the country doing interviews with former runners um uh coach high school coaches you know college coaches olympic coaches all kinds of people trying to find what our story is because it's you know a 50-year story and it has to be like two hours you can't have like a 10-hour film no no you can't have (laughs) 
hours and hours. So it it was a difficult process trying to figure out, you know, how do we whittle it down? Do you know how much of the history do we put into the film? Um, how much of the current situation that's going on and we decided like do we follow a season or do we tell the story of the last 50 years you know it took us a couple of years to kind of whittle that down um and we finally kind of came to the you know moment that we're like well we need to just follow an entire season and see what happens wh- and just watch the story unfold um also the big challenge we had is that nine nine out of 10 people don't know what the hell cross country is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a big problem where you say cross country running. And they're like, uh, what the hell is that? <laughs> and then you tell, and then, and then you tell them and they're like, Oh, so it's like track. You just run around in a circle and you're like, well, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. It's a lot more involved than that. <laughs> and they're trying to explain how the scoring is and things. Cause it's, you know, it's not like it's football or baseball or anything like that. Um, trying to explain the simplest way and the quickest without taking too much time in the film. That was our difficult thing because trying to explain a sport <laughs> and not let it take too much time is not always easy. So we try to kind of integrate how the sport works throughout the film. And we do have a section kind of talking about how the points work because it's, it's just like golf lowest score counts did you um are there any runners that trained with him that ended up being olympic athletes or oh there's a lot there's a A lot lot. yeah there's a lot um no one that per se became you know like a household name household name or anything but a lot of guys over the last 50 years i mean there's dozens and dozens that have gotten full you know full scholarships to college so it's gotten a lot of guys to be able to go to college um, a lot of those guys then continue on and did go in, um, have gone to the Olympics. You know, we've had few, you know, several Olympic athletes throughout time. What was it like? And a, training... and a lot of guys, a lot of guys went to become coaches. So there's a lot of guys that are high school coaches now because of because Mr. Of Newton. Him. What was it like training with someone so legendary? Um, did he just like, was, kick your butt? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's an old school Archie Bunker kind of guy. I mean, he, <laughs> he swears and yells at you like it was 1960. You know, it does, he, there's, <laughs> He's not PC all all the time. He's much better. He's you know he's getting a little slower in his his age, but um, but he uh, yeah. When I was there, it was a lot rougher than it was when I shot the film. The kids, you were like, he's the kids, getting soft. I was like, these kids got it easy, <laughs> and these kids are like, oh my god, this is so hard. But it was. Um, Did you I, ever cry? No, I never cried. No. <laughs> Come on, Bernie. No, I did not. I did see guys cry, but I did not cry. Now did I you did, ever puke? No, I did puke a bunch of times, and everybody did. So, <laughs> and so and a lot, sometimes in the middle of practice, and you're like, well, I still got like five miles to go. I got to get going again because <laughs> he's going to yell at me. <laughs> but I mean, he really, he knows, he knows the guys to yell at, and he knows the guys that he needs to have a softer touch with. So he's very good at reading all of the guys and even it needs to be broken down yeah, and destroyed yeah, and, and, yeah i mean he knows the guys that they love it when they he swears and yells at them and then he knows the other guys that like i can't quite be that rough on him because they're a li- they, because they're gonna start crying they're, they could, you know yeah they're a little yeah they gotta be a little lighter touch um but yeah, I mean it was it was difficult. I mean when you I mean we I ran six days a week all through four years of high school. Yeah, you know, I did cross country and track and I mean we were running all summer long, six days a week. No, I got ten it. miles ten miles a day. Sometimes I mean it, it ranged anywhere from say eight miles to fifteen miles. And I was more in like the top, you know, twenties. Are you still running? Yeah, I still run a bit. Yeah. Okay. Not not like I used to, but I do still <laughs> run. <laughs> uh, some injuries that are, you know, kind of uh slow me down now than I used to, but um but I, yeah, I'm still a runner, you know, it, and a lot it. of the guys are. Uh, for you. I could not do cross country. I did cross country and track, and I just could not do the long distance running. It's t- it's tough. It's, it's really tough much. on the body, and <laughs> yeah. And I realized after my high school career, I was like, wow, you know, I wasn't really built for a distance runner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can sprint really fast, and yes, that's it. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, but it was it was br- brutal workouts, you know. And then, you know, once in a while, you got to hide in the bushes for a few laps. So how, 
<laughs> How many miles were you running a week? Oh, oh, no, a day. Like every day we were running anywhere from minimally six miles to 15 miles, you know, every so day. So a week you ran almost like triple marathons? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there are guys, they would run a thousand miles in the summer, you know, they had, and he had t-shirts. So he'd be like, you could be in the 500 mile club and then the thousand mile club. And there are guys tracking their progress and they would run like a thousand miles in the summer. Did you get that um, nipple rash where your shirt would go against your, sh- your t-shirt and you would just... Hey, get... sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> and you'd have to wear band-aids? <laughs> uh, I did not do that. I wasn't that bad. <laughs> but hey, the Crisco came in handy once in a while. <laughs> I had a friend that um, does marathons and he has to wear little band-aids. Yeah, I mean, it, it can, you know, it rubs and then a little Crisco between the legs a little, you know. Yeah, hey, when you're sweating like crazy out there and running miles it's it's tough (laughs) how can people watch these documentaries um let's see uh missing presumed dead is on vimeo so that can be found online uh long green line uh it is not streaming we did have it streaming for a while uh but now it's available for rental on amazon oh pretty pretty cheap rental and or you can buy the digital download on amazon Okay, that's great. So Long Green Line movie and also Missing Presumed Dead. Yes. I actually have seen Long Green Line twice. Yes. Once with you and another well, time and, on my and, own. And the Chicago Tribune and the Sun-Times did give us, you know, I think it was what, three stars I think they gave us? Yes. They gave us three stars. That's awesome. So that's not too to bad. be on the cover. <laughs> on the cover with three stars. Um, and then, uh, but I haven't seen Missing Presumed Dead. I think I saw it with you once but i can't i can't remember maybe so maybe. i have to watch it again now and see if there's anything i missed yeah you'll have to watch it. it's interesting <laughs> you'll change your view on a few politicians that are quite popular now okay it, in hindsight maybe because when it was films it was they were not as big as they are now uh they were as big but now one of them's quite big <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back now. I'm like, I have to go you back know, and watch it. Mr. I don't remember. Kerry, you know, is quite big now. Oh, John Kerry. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll have to go back then yeah, and, and watch McCain it. is, hmm, he's still hanging in there. <laughs> That's why we'll never be able to see any of his records. Well, isn't, wasn't John McCain a POW? Like, yes, he, he uses was. that quite a bit, right? Yes. So he was against bringing these guys back. Well, let's just say he hasn't uh, helped... As much as the POW could. movement or the families. Wow, that's crazy because he milked that. I remember in the primary um, when he was running. I can't remember who's running for what. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, the, and he have. was just sobbing. And remember, he kind of got into that creepy, like he was crying. He got into some weird POW story. <laughs> yeah, I remember a lot of comedians were like, "Is he like just making fun of him?" Because was, they're like, "Do you okay?" No, I mean, he there, there's no doubt he went through hell. I mean, he was in the Hanoi Hilton. That was not pleasant. But being he, poked by sticks by my cousin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> by my cousins, and they yes. were like, "No, no." Okay, yeah. I know that's horrible. That's horrible. But. No, but I mean, yeah, I mean, he was over there. But you know, um, well, you know, when you s- say propaganda for. The other side it's a little tough to understand sometimes so he has records that are sealed and destroyed well they're sealed they'll never be you they're classified for what do they do with those documents they're classified is there just like some room in the pentagon where there's yeah. like classified documents yeah there's 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 all kinds of different libraries and vaults that are just they're just classified it's it's only a few people can even look at them they should scan them. Guys, you guys need to get a scanner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's invest in a scanner, U.S. government. We can scan yes, them. Yes. <laughs> and then we can put like a password on it and then we can shred documents. <laughs> Who wants stinky documents from 1950? <laughs> really smelly with like mold. But yeah, there's a lot of things, you know, and you know, a lot of the, the POW movement, uh, they're not quite friends with him. They're not. That's interesting because he milks that so much. Yes, he does. <laughs> but, you know, his his father was quite important during Vietnam as well. So Brady looks like he's scared to reveal things. You guys should see his face. He's like, I'm going to get shot uh, the second I walk out of Rosie's apartment. <laughs> it's all right. I'm on their list anyway. Are you on the so. list? Could be. Not not the list, but another list, I'm is sure. Is Bill on the list? Bill Dumas? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's on the list. I'm sure he is. There's 
there's all kinds of lists, and I don't know what lists we're on, but you know, we're everybody's tracked. <laughs> Enemy of the state in my apartment. Yes, yes. <laughs> and Bill, uh, you know, Bill's a big uh, supporter of the veterans, and he just he just had a, uh, a homeless veterans doc come out as well. Oh, he did. Quite, what is it called? And I can't remember. I'm You're terrible. blanking. Google Bill Dumas, I everyone. Totally, I totally blanked. Um, oh, Jesus. And I just watched it the other day. Um, can't remember. All right. Listeners, yep. Google Bill Dumas. Bill yes. Dumas. Yes, yes, yes. So is he a filmmaker or did he fall into this just to... Oh, uh, no. He's a documentary filmmaker. Okay. Um, so that's, just because that's what he does. Um, yeah. I mean, and, you know, a lot of it, you know, started with his, you know, his uncle and everything with the Korean War and whatnot, but he is a documentary filmmaker and he's very involved with the POW movement and veterans and, you know, there's a lot of revealing information that no one knows about the VA in I mean, Los it's just, Angeles. It's just sad. I have been to the VA several times to perform. Well, and you, and you know, the homeless, and, are not, homeless vets aren't allowed really to be there. Well, it's, it's their land. It's also just the lack of care is insane. The, um, Okay, this is what I don't understand. These people are sickens me over there. risking their lives and their mental health. Yes. And other physical health and mental and emotional health. And yet there's this giant, insane, crazy military budget. Yes. And the money is not going to people who are being promised certain things and they're not getting it. No. Well, and the fact is the VA in, in, on the West Side, you know, I find it appalling that they were going to lease part of that land for a dog park when the fact is most of that land is not being used there are empty buildings everywhere and they should be housing our homeless veterans that's the land is for them the family that gave los angeles that land something like over 100 years ago was specifically for the veterans. And they said that in their donation. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, and that's been known forever. But when you have, you know, money and power and you have a very high real estate area around there, you so know, the, there's a lot of people who, who that don't, don't know, want, they don't want homeless people around, you know, Brentwood. So for those of you who don't know, we're talking about the VA Center in Los Angeles, in West Los Angeles. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, a lot of it's not utilized for the veterans. And it's a very uh, nice area. It's beautiful over it's there. It's like and you could house, Beverly Hills. You, you, I mean, it was supposed to, <laughs> yeah, and it, yes, it is. I mean, it's right, right in that area. And the thing is, it's like that land was given there for veterans to live and to be taken care of and take care of their health and there are a lot of empty buildings there i've been there most several of it's times. empty yeah most i've of been it's there empty. several times to perform on uh va shows because i yeah i mean it's truth. it's it's and unbelievable it's completely empty it's like a ghost town it is it is and the fact is you could take pretty much all of the homeless vets off the streets in los angeles and be able to take care of them there and Los Angeles has a very, very high number of homeless Huge. Vets. It's one of the largest. Huge, huge yes. number. Gigantic, gigantic population of homeless vets that need help, you know, from across the board, from physical to mental health. Mm-hmm. And they're being thrown on the streets. They're being they're, left on they're Skid Row. Left on Skid Row. They're trying to go to the VA to get help, but they don't always give them the help that they need uh, so because they just the don't reason, have the facilities aren't there. What is the know? reason for this denial? Do you know? Money. Because there's a lack of it or because there's money being... Well, a lot of it is a lot of rich people in that area. I'm not trying to put, you know, names on people. But, you know, when you have a very affluent area... So they've lobbied they don't, against it. They don't want all these homeless vets coming over there. They don't want all these homeless vets wandering around over there to get medical help and things like that or even be put into housing there because they they have some idea that it'll just destroy their neighborhoods that's actually happening right now um we have a horrible 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 metro system in los angeles and they were trying to build it underground through beverly hills because it makes sense to go straight through the city yes it would have gone to santa monica and it would go straight to santa monica and there was a huge lobby against it because 
um, those areas did not want, quote unquote, those types of people going yes. through. First of all, I use public transportation all the time. Uh, I do too. <laughs> so um, ex- that's, excuse me? And yeah. it would alleviate tons of traffic and would be better for the greater. I mean, I know so many people who live in Los Angeles who said if there was a better public transportation system, I would use it. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I get that all the time. I, I hear I, that on the daily. Yes, I do too. I mean, I don't use it extensively, but I do use it. But it's it's like a hodgepodgey whole crazy system. It's that not it's connected not, at all. Nothing's it's, connected it's, to anything. So damn impossible to figure out where the hell do you go? Like some people don't even know that there's a subway system in Los no, Angeles. No, a lot of people don't. Of people and I don't take know. the red line quite I take often. The red line all the time, yeah. I live I live a block away. I use it. I zip through Hollywood all the time. But it's like people they don't even know there's a subway in the city and it's, it's beautiful it's wonderful it's very convenient actually <laughs> yes. if, if you're along the line if you're along the line but if you aren't yeah oy, it's a nightmare because then oh well i gotta take that bus and then i gotta take that bus and then i gotta take that it's uh, yeah and then go over that light rail and try to get i it's 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 so confusing people in beverly hills just let them build a stupid train okay <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i yeah I, just let them I know it's ridiculous. I mean, I've I've read extensively about that, and it's you know special interests, and so that's what's ridiculous. going on with the VA hospital as a well. A lot of that it's as a well. Similar thing. Okay. Similar thing. Very similar. They don't want that element there, you know, in their neighborhoods. Just like the subway, they think that, like. What I mean, it's they think it's going to like destroy their neighborhoods if you have I'm a subway. I'm sure it's not everyone. I don't think so. I'm sure it's not everyone. No, in no, I'm not trying. Yeah, I don't want to put everyone. Bad about yeah, I'm not trying people. to clump everybody in there. I'm just saying there's certain, a there's a lobby. There's, there's a, a lobby. certain faction there that are very powerful, and you know, a certain politician that makes sure those things. You know, don't get passed. don't get past. Although I just want you to know that my little dog Mitzi. I won't talk about him, but <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that he'll my, be out of office very soon. My cause... little dog Mitzi was very offended that you said lease the area for a dog park because she is all for dog parks. <laughs> hey, I love dog parks too, but not and... not on VA land. <laughs> <laughs> my little dog yeah. is looking at me and she's like, "What? Why is he talking bad about dog parks? What's wrong with him?" <laughs> They're like, we love dog parks. We love dog Come parks. On. We I, don't. I, I want to go right now. <laughs> 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 all right we're gonna wrap up um yep. do you have anything to promote um not a lot i mean i'm working on a bunch of things right now in developments um you know i'm uh, primarily an editor now but i do uh produce a bit and we are working on a i'm co co-pro- i'm a co-producer on a new series that we're doing a comedy series so we're called rick's parking so we're hoping that that gets going but we're still kind of in the process of that one all right, guys, and look up the long green line on Amazon. Yes, the long green line, long green. Watch line. it. Not, not the long, the long green mile. No, <laughs> no, the long green line. <laughs> like not the green yes. mile. What? what? Yes. No, not the. And the and the reason I didn't say why it was called the long green line was because back in the fifties or sixties. Somebody said, "My God, look at that! Look at all those runners. That's like a huge long green line." Because <laughs> we do have the, lo- the largest, largest cross country team in the U.S. Awesome, and also missing, presumed dead. Yes, Google it, watch it, what? And yes, and that's on Vimeo, it's and on that's Vimeo. out there. So yeah, missing, presumed dead. Please take a check out on that and look up uh, Bill Dumas. Yes, and, and find out about what is going on with the U.S. government people. Let's think yes, outside the box yes, and not uh, be brainwashed by mainstream media, guys. Please visit outoftheboxpodcast dot com and. Subscribe to us on iTunes, subscribe to us on Stitcher, put us on your favorites and leave comments and rate. It really, really, really helps us out a lot. And please donate to the podcast because I need money, guys. I yes. need money to keep this thing going. Help. Thanks, guys. I love you. <laughs>